with the little that we do know. You bless us. With the little that we are able to understand of your word. You still do amazing things in our lives with it. So today, Lord, as we continue studying this parable of the prodigal son, we ask, Lord, that you may speak to us. I can't teach enough. I don't know enough. I know there's so much more in there than I know. So therefore, Lord, I ask the Holy Spirit to be present here today. And help us to understand the message in it. For each one of us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to congratulate our mothers here again. As uh, we have already. But we'd like to thank each uh, mother here for everything you've done. We have all have amazing mothers and those of you that are here today. May God bless you and continue giving you the patience that you need and the love for your children to bring them up in the way that God wants you to bring them up. If there's a, a love that, uh, that God once the, it's the closest thing that God is to in this earth is actually the love of a mother for the children. So again, we'd like to congratulate you and tell each husband here or daughter and son or sons to make tomorrow uh, your mother's, make it tomorrow's day a special day for your mother that uh, go out, sacrifice, do whatever you have to do, but make it special and let her know how, how special she is. We'd like to thank each one of you, especially all the support that you have given us. As you've, we've started to get, get together here last Saturday, you've seen all this equipment that we have, everything that we've bought, and all of this has been because of your faithful giving. It hasn't come from anywhere else has come from, from your giving and the soundboard we have back there, the, uh, the, the video uh, that we were able to take, uh, uh, all this equipment that we, we have to be able to provide a good church. It is because of your giving. And uh, we, we thank you so much for your, for your faithful giving so that that way we can continue to give this kind of service to create a place that you can come to once a week and bring your family to and, 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 come, and, and come together to meet God. Come together to meet God so that, that you separate yourself from everything else and your children can come to learn about God and you can come and enjoy this service. And those of you that have, that have been giving, we, we thank you so much because you have helped for everyone to provide. You've provided for everyone here a good service. You've provided ways for us to be able to do this. As you notice that here we don't have an offering time. We don't pass the plate. We have uh, two boxes there in the back where, and we have some envelopes. You can either put uh, money in there or you can put it inside the envelope and tell us how you want it to, to be used. And so as you, as you leave today, as any time you can, if, you feel that God moves you to do that, uh, please do that, and we'll be grateful, and, and the gospel will continue to, to be preached. The gospel will be able to, to reach other people as we are here. That is our purpose. We're here to create a place where we can invite the community, where we can invite others to come and experience God. And by experiencing God, their, their families can get better. They can, have, they can be a better marriage. They can be better parents. The children to provide a place uh, where your children can grow up correctly. Because, you know, as you, as you get older, as you begin to have children, you find out how much help you need to bring up children. 
that a lot of times it's not just you. You need a church. You need a church environment. You need different things to be able to bring up our youth, to bring up our, our young people. So we'd like to thank each one of you that has uh, already cooperated for this and has, has, has done this in such a, a grateful way. And I want you to just notice that these, all these things we've been able to provide so that you, we can have good church here. We're going to continue today with uh, our, our theme that we have been, we started last, last Saturday, from riches to rags. And we looked at Luke chapter 15, the, and we're concentrating on the parable of the prodigal son. One of the most powerful pra uh, uh, parables that we read in the scriptures. A parable where, where it is trying to tell us how much God loves us, how patient God is with humanity. And, and, and every time I study this parable, and, and as I was preparing it and studying it this week, uh, you know, I had something already prepared, uh, but as I, I sat down by myself this, uh, th th this week, I have the, the, this place here in, in, in town that I go to in a sort of a place I'm secluded almost by myself, and, and I go in there, I pull out my computer, and I begin to study. I begin to see uh, something else. I begin to see uh, something more than I, had, than I had seen before. And that is the, 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 the amazing thing about, about scriptures, is that you can study the Bible for, for months. You can study the Bible for years. You can study and know one parable for, for a long time. And yet you go into it and you pray and you begin to go into it and you find something complete that will just blow your mind. Something you've never seen before. And that's why the scriptures is just so exciting. It's so exciting to study. It's so exciting to read. Let us put you into the context of this parable. And the context of this parable in Luke chapter 15, it is a context where Jesus is surrounded by publicans who were sinners. We studied last week and we saw who publicans were. They were actually people who had betrayed their own nation, the Jewish nation, and they would collect taxes from their own people by the, from the Romans, and then they would give it to the Romans, and the Romans would give them a cut of those taxes. So therefore, the Jews saw them as traitors. They saw them as sinners. They were usually people that were not very religious. They were just very money-hungry people, and, and, and they were not looked at as good people. They were rejected by everyone else. And in fact, people thought they rejected them with good reason. With good reason they rejected. I mean, do you have people in this world that you think that we can reject with good reason? I mean, do, we, do you think of people in society that we think God won't have a problem if I reject them? These were people that the Jewish nation and the Jewish leaders felt that it was okay to reject them. But yet, Jesus would spend time with them. Jesus would also spend time with prostitutes. He would spend time with, with other people, all kinds of people that rejected, and they would come to Jesus, and Jesus would speak to them, and, and, and they felt that Jesus, that Jesus was able to reach them and to speak to them. The tax collectors and the sinners, and if you go to Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 3, gives us the context of this parable. You cannot understand the context of the, of the story of the parable of the prodigal son unless you put it together with the context. And verses, the first two verses of chapter 15, 1 to 3, is what gives us the context. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. This man who calls himself God, who calls himself holy, this man who calls himself God, he actually, he actually receives sinners and he sits down to eat with them. See, in the Middle East, to be able to eat with people is something big. To eat with somebody is something big. 
It means that you have a deep relationship. You care for them. They didn't just sit and eat with anybody. Sitting down and eating is something big in the Middle East. So for Jesus to actually sit and eat with sinners who was a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi. A, a person of theology. A spiritual man. To then sit with sinners. That was something big. And they said, how can this be? So Jesus is trying to teach them something about God that they didn't know. So that's why he tells them the parable. The parable of the prodigal son. And as we have read the story of the prodigal son, it is about a son, the two brothers, and a father. And these two brothers, and one of them, the younger brother tells the father, I want my money. You know, it's my money and I want it now. It's my money and I want it now. It was like telling his father, I want you to die. I want my money now. I want, you to, I want to enjoy my money now. And we talked last week of what that meant and, and what it meant to leave home. But through this story, Jesus shows the lack of concern for the lost from most of the religious people compared to the great concern that God has for the lost. Jesus wanted to show them how they that were so religious were concerned so little about those who didn't know God. But yet at the same time, he wanted to show them how concerned God is for those who don't know him. There is an inconsistency in Christianity when people go through extremes to be holy, to sanctify their own lives, but yet feel they have nothing to do when it comes to helping another person. There's people who will go in the woods and they will hide in the country and they will do stuff. They will go through all kinds of stuff to look for their own salvation, for their own holiness, but yet will not do anything to reach somebody else for Jesus. There is a contradiction there. There is a problem there because God wants to tell people that it's not just about you, it's about others too. So there is an inconsistency when Christians try to look for their own salvation, for their own holiness, without looking at who else needs God. A person whose primary concern is their own life, to make themselves holy, actually becomes selfish. They do not acquire the character of God. Acquiring the character of God has to do with you going out and saving and looking out for other people because that's what God does. That's what God does. Being interested in other people. Being interested in the salvation of other people. Being interested in those who have left, who, has, who have less than you. Being interested in those who did not grow up with the type of parents that you grew up with. Those who did not have the same advantages that you have. By you doing that, you become closer to God more than by sitting at home and grabbing your Bible and just praying. Jesus wanted to show them that worrying about the well-being of others, caring for the disobedient, loving those who have strayed away from God is part of the character of God. That God's major work is saving the lost, not applauding your holiness. God is not there to applaud your holiness. He is there to get you involved in the salvation of other people who need God. If you want the character of God, you want to be 
you, you want to be broken and become like Jesus. You must be able to love like Jesus loved. Your goals must be the goals of Jesus. The church is not here to impress God of how holy we are. Sometimes we think that that's our job. To become so holy. And we think that our job is to impress God about our holiness. The work of the church is not to impress God with our holiness. The work of the church is to do what Jesus did when he came here, which was to make a difference in people's lives. Jesus did not spend much time in the temple, but he sure spent a lot of time feeding people, healing people, making a difference in people's lives, and he especially spent time with those that everyone else rejected. But you see, sometimes we believe that we have it all together. And that we're the ones who have it all together. Have you ever seen the people, whoever, have you ever had somebody that oh, they're constantly counseling others? You can't talk to them about anything because the minute you bring up a little subject, they know about it and they're going to counsel you on it. They're not going to talk to you about it. Because they always have to take the side of the conversation where they are going to tell you how it is. You do that once or twice and you never again talk to that person about a problem in your life, right? Never again. Because most of the time you know what to do. And you need a listening ear, but all of a sudden this person comes off as if they have it all together. What happens, there are some people who say, why is it that I never have friends? And it's because sometimes we come off as if we have it all together, you know, and, and anytime somebody comes to us, they're like, oh, okay, well, I better go somewhere else. This person has it all together. Jesus wasn't like that. He was able to listen to people. And we make a mistake when we think that we have it all together for people because really none of us has it all together. But the idea of always counseling somebody else makes them think that we have it all together when inside we know we don't. We're just covering up. In fact, those people are better off than we are because they're actually open about their problems and we're not. We don't have it all together. Those that have known me for a while have heard me say this a lot of times, that we're all crazy. I, we are. There's something wrong with all of us. If we go back to the Luke chapter 15, verse 11, the story, it says that he said a certain man, Luke chapter 15, verse 11, said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly Sadly had filled his stomach with the pods of the, of the swine that the swine ate. So no one gave him anything. Here's this young man who's got a perfect home. He goes out there and, 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 and he takes all the money that, that his father gave him, his part, and he takes it and he spends it. He throws it away. So finally he just runs out of money. And he ends up being a Jewish man. I mean, Jesus really does this story right. Because he doesn't say that this young man became a shepherd. He told them that he, he, the story goes that he went to take care of pigs, one of the worst things that a Jewish person can ever do. And that's where Jesus puts him. Last week we talked about him leaving home. Now he's already left home. 
Now, a question that I asked myself as I read this is, why would this young man leave home? He had it made. His father was a millionaire. His father was a good spiritual man. His father didn't beat him or anything. In fact, he's a perfect, you know, God is really in the story. God is the father. He is perfect. Why would anyone leave? Why would any, this young man leave that type of situation where everything is perfect? For probably the same reason why you and I have left God in the past, right? Why you and I have chosen the wrong way. See, in this story, I want you to see yourself in it. This sermon is not for somebody else, it's for you. We, we sometimes tend to judge other people. But we have all made bad decisions. One of the problems that humanity has is that there is a need of us to be like other people. We want to be like other people. People say, oh, I don't follow anybody. I'm myself. You're full of it. You just don't follow certain people, but you follow somebody else. We like to be like other people. And this young man probably wanted to be like his friends. And, and we have all failed in that area. Where we all feel that we need to be, we need to be with, with somebody else. We all need to be like someone else. We all, we want to look alike. We want to do things that others do. Most of all are we, are, are, of us are not rational human beings, believe me. Sin has affected our decision-making process more than we think. Humans make the weirdest decisions. I mean, come on, look back in your life. And you can see that you've made the weirdest decisions without even knowing why you made them. And the thing is that we look at that and we look at our own decision and it helps us to be compassionate about the decisions that other people have made that might not be the best. And a lot of times we human beings, we're not compassionate to one another. We think that we have it all together and we don't think about the decisions that we've made. And we need to be compassionate with others as they also have made bad decisions. They did a study in the, in, in, in the 1950s by uh, a psychologist, uh, Solomon Ash. And the study was that they, they took some lines, they drew some lines, and they said, uh, here are three lines, okay, all the same size, and they took them to another spot where another group of lines and said, in that group of lines, I need you to pick one line that is exactly the length of that line. There was line, one line that was clearly exactly the length of the other three lines. But when they went in the room to pick that line, there was a group of people there who knew what was going on. And that group of people actually picked another line that was completely wrong. 75 of the people went along with the line that was completely wrong just because the other people told them to. And you say, wow, that's, that's crazy. I wouldn't do that. Well, some of you are paying $90, $90 for a pair of pants that you threw away 10 years ago. Right? Why would you wear whipped up pants? Come on. Why would you wear pants that are ripped up that 10 years ago you would have thrown them away, but now you go to the store and you spend $90 for them? Because everybody else is doing it. That's why. Why would people wear clothes five sizes larger than what they can really wear? Why would people make holes in their bodies and hang stuff from it? Why would people do all kinds of stuff that people do when you really look at the things that we do? We're doing it because other people do it. We are influenced by other people. 
and we're influenced in one way or another. You may not be influenced in one way, but others are influenced in other ways. Why would you pay money to destroy your lungs? Why would you take alcohol, put a little bit of taste in it, and actually put alcohol in your body that ruins your, 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 your liver and, and your brain cells? And Why would anybody do that? Because it's the style. It's what people do. I'm not trying to make everyone and anyone here feel bad for, for these things. What I'm trying to say is be compassionate with people who make wrong decisions because in one way or another you are also making bad decisions yourself. You don't have it all together as you might think you do. And Jesus is trying through this story, trying to, to let them know that this young man, although he lost everything, he was in the pig pen. He was taking care of pigs. God still cared about him. And God cares about those people that have made bad decisions. And God cares about those people that are hurting. And God cares about those people that are in problems because of their own fault. God still loves them. And he still cares about them. It's been proven that a greater percentage of people, I mean, just look at a decision-making process. It's been proven that a greater percentage of people die because of natural causes than because of murder or accident. It's been proven that most people are not going to die because someone murders you, because once someone comes into your house and kills you, because, uh, uh, because you are dying in a car accident. No, it's been proven that most of us are going to die from a heart attack, from a natural cause, a disease, or old age. Yet look how much money we spent to put alarms in our houses, on guns, and all these things to protect ourselves from the least way that we would probably die. Yet our bodies, which is the natural way, would probably die. We don't care. We do all kinds of stuff when a heart attack is just right around the corner or all this kind of, and we're okay with that. But we'll get an alarm, $10,000 alarm in our house to protect from probably the least way that you're going to die. What I'm trying to say with these people is that we're not as smart as we think we are. We're not as smart as we think we are. Our decision-making process as human beings is not the best, has not been the best. There's also people, you know, the, the quick fix. Humans have the tendency to want to fix things now. You know, you go to a gym, you start working out, man, you're working out for three months, you don't see much, some guy comes by and says, listen, man, take this powder, you know, you know I, mean, I mean, it'll probably hurt your liver and your kidneys and all that, but you're going to get muscles. Hey, God, I don't care, give that to me, right? I want to get muscles now. I want to do this now. And, and because of that process, we also make mistakes. We don't like to wait for things. We make mistakes. But what about the people that are, that are born in a situation? Some people are born in this type of situation. I mean, this week we've heard of those three young ladies who were kidnapped. Those three young ladies we know that are not going to have a normal life the rest of their life. Something that happened to them that was none of their fault is going to affect them the rest of their lives, the way they think, the way they do things. Some people are born into some difficult situations. Some people are born as children of prostitutes who see their mother work right before them in their, in their, in their home. Some children are, 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 are born to people who use drugs right in their face. Some people are born into some difficult situations in, pe in life, people. What I'm trying to get you out is 
I'm trying to get out of you the attitude that we might have of the Pharisees and the Sadducees of looking at sinners. Oh, look at them. Without thinking of what maybe took them there. Jesus was trying to tell them that this young man, he put the young man in a perfect, in a perfect scenario, perfect home. And yet he left it. And he lost everything. And he ended up in a pig pen. And Jesus is trying to tell him that the pig pen were those people, those republic, those not Republicans, right? The publicans. <laughs> the publicans and the sinners. He said, those are them. He said, those are them. He said, but you know what? I still care about them. I still care about them. But there was a thing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were in the pig pen too, but they didn't know it. They didn't know it. You see, someone could be in some type of sin and we're accusing them, but we could be in another type of sin that to God, we're in exactly the same place. We're in exactly the same place. To me, this story tells me a lot about compassion. See, Jesus is trying to tell them that the God that they were professing to believe had intense compassion for people. That the ones that most religious people tend to reject, God has an intense compassion for them. And if we are going to be the church and the followers of Christ, we must have compassion for people also. I mean, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us, But God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for you to be perfect. He didn't wait for you to start coming to church. Jesus died for you before you were born, before, before your mother was born, before he died for your sins. So that if you decided to follow him, you could have everlasting life. I read something from a pastor, Pastor Max D. Yance. He said, God knows the things that would have happened if the things that did happen hadn't happened. Do I need to read that again? God knows the things that would have happened if the things that did happen hadn't happened. In other words, God doesn't just see the young lady who's shooting herself up with heroin. He doesn't, just, he doesn't do like us who walks by and says, how stupid can she be? God sees who her family was. God see, sees the opportunity that she had in her life. God sees where she grew up. God sees everything. He doesn't just see the one action that we make. God sees everything. And to God, she is still his child. And God has a problem when Christians have no compassion for those people. God has a problem when we see ourselves better than anyone else. God has a problem when we have problem with race. God has a problem when we think of ourselves as better than anyone else. God has a problem with that because in the Bible it doesn't say, for God so loved Adventists, for God so loved Christians, for God so loved Methodists. It says, for God so loved the what? The world. The world. For God so loved the world. Now this young man, he left home at home. He loves, you know, he was loved no matter what. He left 
and he went out into the world. He thought he was, he he was going to really enjoy life now because at home he was secluded. He couldn't have fun. He wasn't free. So he, so, so he wanted to be free. And when, when he went out there in the world, in, in, in his father's home, he was accepted no matter what. He was loved. See, with God, you are loved first. No matter what, you're loved first. God looks at you and he says, I love you. He said, well, God, you know, I'm not, I, I, you know, I don't go to church that much. I don't read the Bible. He says, I love you. In fact, he said, God, I don't believe in you. He says, I love you anyways. See, God starts off from the premises that he loves you no matter what. He starts off there. But the world has a lot of ifs. And this young man found that out. He went out there and he found out, hey, when he he went out there, this guy had a big bank account. You know, this guy was on a Corvette. You know, he had a condo on the beach. He was set. Oh, man, people loved him. And he found out that now he was a servant of the ifs. He found out that the world loves you if you have a good car. That the world loves you if you look a certain way. That the world loves you if you're skinny. The world loves you if you're in shape. The world loves you if you have money. The world loves you if you have an education. The world loves you if you talk a certain way. The world loves you if you look a certain way. So he found out that the world had all these ifs at home. He didn't have any ifs. The father loved them, period. So these ifs were driving him crazy. All this money had to go to provide these ifs. Because if not, the world was not going to love him. And the story goes that the minute he lost all his money, he was done. He was done. See, the world will drain you. You will constantly work and work and try to fulfill these ifs because you want to satisfy your neighbor. You want to satisfy people. You're constantly trying to impress somebody. You're constantly asking yourself, what will happen to me if I lose everything? Will I still have the same friends? Will I still have the same people? And it's a constant competition of trying to keep up with all of, the, all of these ifs. See, at first, the young man was very attractive. He had learned good principles at home. He had learned good principles at home. You know, and, and I see a lot of times us as young people who are, you know, I, I, most of the young people who are born in Christian homes, the time comes when we, we want to test the waters out there. Right? And we want to test the waters out there. And when we test the waters out there in the world, we leave with the inheritance of our father. What's the inheritance? Good character, good principles, things that you learned where? In church. That's where you learned them. You learned them through your mother. You learned them through your father. The same ones that you want to leave, the same ones that you are reject, are the ones who gave that to you. So you go out there and the, and the world goes, wow, what a young man, what a young... And, and, and they offer you these good jobs and you're like, hey, I can make it on my own. But you forget that where you learned that was with the Father. Was at home. And you see that you're having success out there. Do you know what an alternator is? It's something you have in your car. You have a battery, right? If you didn't have your alternator, the battery of your car could only last you maybe a day. A day or two the most, if it was a really good battery. Because as you turn on air conditioner, ride your car, everything, your battery would die. But you have an alternator, and the alternator continuously charges up your battery. As we grow up close to God, God is that alternator who is a fountain of blessing who continuously fills us. 
and recharges us every day. But when you are in the world on your own, that alternator is gone, and all of a sudden, you burn out. Because you disconnect yourself from the source, and there's nothing. And that's what this young man did. He found out that the world robbed him of everything. Robbed him of his youth, money, character, future. Now he finally was just like everyone else. Now he, he wanted to be free while he's free. He wanted to be away from his father, he's away from his father. He had everything he wanted, and the minute that he thought he had everything he wanted, he found himself in the pig pen, taking care of pigs. You got what you wanted. Finally, he became like everybody else. Young people, what makes you special is what God has given you. When you become like your friends who don't know God, there is nothing special about you anymore. You're just like everyone else. And he became like everyone else. And when he did, he found himself taking care of, pet, of pigs. You see, Jesus wanted to show the Pharisees that when humanity takes those wrong turns in life, like you have, like I have, and we make those mistakes like that young man, a dumb mistake, no need at all to make that mistake. And yet they make it. I mean, we're not even thinking about those that are born in difficult situations. But a young man who had everything. And he, was, he ended up in that pig pen. Jesus wanted to let them know, I am with them in that pig pen. It doesn't matter what decision you've made in your life. It doesn't matter how many things you've done wrong in your life. Jesus is there with you and he wanted to let those people know that. And he wanted to let them know that if we call ourselves his followers, we must have compassion of people. Because we've all been there. We've all made bad decisions. Never think of yourself as better than anyone else. Because you know that you have been in that pig pen more than one time. And that should move you to have compassion for others. To have from compassion for those who are now in the middle of that pig pen and think nobody loves them. could be somebody in your family could be a friend could be people you know people in school that need compassion that need compassion and that young man as he was in that pig pen he remembered his home he remembered his father He went to search for freedom and he became a slave to the things of the world. He was searching for freedom. He wanted to be free. And instead, he found himself in a pig pen with no money, with nothing. But Jesus wanted to let them know that like those publicans and those sinners that they said that he was, he ate with them. He wanted to tell them they might be in the pig pen now. But you know what? I don't stand in a palace and tell them to come. I go with them in, in the pig pen. And I bring them out of the pig pen. Whatever bad decisions we've made in our lives, 
God can heal you. God can take you out of it. In fact, God knew that you were going to do that. Your bad decisions are not a surprise to God. They're no surprise, God. You know, one day you do something wrong, God, and say, Oh my God, I didn't know you were going to do that. It's incredible how it happens. We don't understand it all. But if God, if God is God, He knew. And He also has a way out. He also has a way out. He has compassion for you. young man as he was there he began to think about home maybe today you have left Christ maybe you've left the church for a while and you are tired of the ifs of this world you're burning yourself out trying to make people happy trying to fit in to do all kinds of things to feel okay. But you know you don't still feel okay. You can look good. You can wear the right clothes. You can have the right car. But there's still always something more. And you need. You're going to burn yourself out trying to continue to fulfill those gifts. But the difference between God and that is that there's no if for God. He loves you from the moment you come to Him, no matter what. There are no ifs for God. I want you to listen to this song. This is one of the most powerful hymns that I have heard. I want you that as you listen to this, I just want you to close your eyes. And if you'd rather have Jesus, if you'd rather leave everything aside, and if today you feel the desire that you'd rather have Jesus more than anything in this world, if there's other things that you want besides Jesus, then that's okay. You're not there yet. You still need to spend some time in the pig pen. You need to eat a little bit of that food that the pigs were eating. And that's okay. But if you're tired of the ifs of this world, and you say, I'd rather have Jesus, I want you to come forward.